Jairus' daughter was running out of time. Now we've told this story so many times that we've lost some of the drama of it. Jesus is always crossing the sea by some boat or another healing people. And it's easy to lose track of the side characters like Jairus who haven't heard this story for a hundred generations. Jairus' daughter was running out of time. And this leader of the synagogue is out of options. So he turns to a traveling teacher with a reputation for healing. When he saw him, Jairus fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jairus' daughter was running out of time. Now I cannot imagine what that father and leader in his faith community must have felt with each step. He doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He doesn't know if Jesus can heal his little daughter or if he's a fraud. He doesn't know if they'll make it to her bedside in time. Does he get more fearful with each step? Or more anxious? Either way, he surely worried as a large crowd followed and pressed in on Jesus. Jairus' daughter was running out of time, and this faith healer who had agreed to help was slowed down as he tried to make his way to his 12-year-old daughter's bedside. And that large crowd pressing in on Jesus held more than a delay. <coughs> Mark's story of Jairus and his daughter gets interrupted <coughs> as another daughter needs help as well. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better rather grew worse. And this kind of ailment made her unclean. She was unwelcome in worship and unwelcome in her community. She couldn't worship and anyone she touched could not worship until they had purified themselves as well. And after 12 years of suffering and exclusion, she had learned that pleading would not get her very far. Jairus may have Jesus' attention, but she has a plan. She plans to sneak in with the crowd and to grab a piece of her healing, trusting that the merest contact with Jesus' clothes would be enough to save her from her suffering. When I was in seminary, we studied this passage in my preaching class. My professor was big into the theater of the text, so we each took a part and acted this story out together. Being the firstborn standard-bearing overachiever that I am, I, of course, volunteered to play Jesus. And Dr. Anna Carter Florence, without hesitation, cast me as the woman who'd been suffering from hemorrhages. <laughs> My friend Simone was cast as Jesus. We took our places with most of the class naturally crowding around Simone and me desperately trying to break through and catch just the hem of her shirt sleeve. And when she felt my tug, she immediately turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Simone's piercing gaze in that moment was inescapable. The whole shuffling, shoving group of us instantly halted. No crowd would have been able to hide me from that question. I'm confident that Jesus did not know who touched his clothes when he asked the question. Mark's Jesus is very human and not the all-knowing poetic preacher we meet, say, in the Gospel of John. He was immediately aware that power had gone forth 
from him, but he did not know into whom. The woman does, though. She knows that question is for her. And she knows that her stolen touch cannot stay anonymous. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembled. Fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Her body has been healed. But that's not the same as being made well. Turns out that being made well takes more than just touching Jesus' clothes. When the woman's bleeding stops, the text says not that she was saved, but that she was healed. <coughs> Contact with Christ can heal a broken body, but being made well affects our whole self. After she has confessed that Jesus healed her. After she tells the whole truth in front of a large crowd that had kept her on the fringes for 12 years. Then, Jesus tells her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. With Jesus' blessing, she is more than healed. She is finally made well. Saved from her suffering and restored to her community of faith. But I wonder, after 12 years of suffering, how long it took that woman to tell the whole truth. I wonder how much fear and trembling can slow down a story. And I wonder if the moment that the woman's 12-year flow of blood stopped, if the blood stopped flowing through the heart of the 12-year-old girl's heart as well. While he was still speaking, while Jesus was giving his blessing to this woman, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Sure, they've heard stories that Jesus can teach. Sure, they've heard stories that Jesus can heal people and feed the hungry. But, as early as Mark 5, no one has yet heard if Jesus can raise the dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And maybe there's a, a nugget in there of, do you really want this man who has been touched by this unclean woman to come into your house? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader, leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And at that point, the crowd disperses a little bit. Only a few of the disciples are allowed to come to Jairus' house. And instead, Jairus and the girl's mother and Jesus and just a handful of disciples go up to where the ex, the extra room where the girl is and see her there. Now all around the house is grieving going on. This tragedy has just occurred. Jairus' daughter was running out of time and now she has run out. And if Jesus' goal was to bring a lot of attention, to show a deed of power, to demonstrate to the world, yes, this is the Messiah capable of doing amazing things, he would have brought the little girl out immediately. But instead, he tells them, why are you weeping? She's not dead, she's merely asleep. And the crowd knows what sleeping girls look like, and so they laugh at him, because this is not that. This is not pretending. This is not a coma. This little girl has died. And so Jesus and his small group, parents and disciples and Jesus only, go into the little girl, and he tells her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Almost 
the entirety of the New Testament was originally written in Greek. It was a language of trade. It was how people communicated with one another across the Roman Empire and across the world. And yet, when Mark writes this story, there are two words that he does not put in Greek. Two words that his Greek-speaking audience need to translate. Talitha kum. Those words are Aramaic. The translation is accurate. They mean little girl, get up. But that's the language that was spoken in first century Palestine. And so these words were important enough to mark into his community that he didn't translate them. He gave the initial words that Jesus spoke. Not because the words are magical. But because Jesus woke the dead with a tender touch, with a kind word. Not with some powerful all-encompassing grand gesture but with a quiet moment raising the girl from the dead. At that point, Jesus tells them not to say anything as though rumors of a little girl who was dead and now is walking around will not spread. Jesus tells them to give her something to eat showing that her body still needs care. Jesus tells them to tell no one because he doesn't want to be known as the great healer. He wants his healing to be understood in light of the cross and resurrection that are to come. Many chapters from him. But he also does the healing so that those who saw it and those who hear the stories in days, weeks, generations to come will not fear but we'll believe. There's a lot to fear in the world right now. Wars, rumors of wars, economic forces, trade disputes, unruly rulers, dwindling finances, declining health. And our faith, uh, and our fear can find its focus almost anywhere. But Jesus reminds us do not fear. Only believe. <clears throat> and just as faith made the woman well, and just as faith made Jairus continue to try, even after his time had run out, faith can sustain us through for whatever we are called to do. And we may run out of money, like the woman who had been suffering from him. And we may run out of time like Jairus' daughter. But we will never run out of the powerful love of God in Christ Jesus. Christ's powerful love has ransomed us from our captivity to sin and death. Christ's powerful love has healed our wounded souls. Christ's powerful love has restored us to right relationship with the Lord our God. Christ's powerful love has forgiven all our debts and empowered us to sing praises to our heavenly King until the end of the age. Therefore, let us get up like the little girl and tell our whole truth like the woman who was healed. Let us spread the good news of the powerful love of Jesus Christ. And praise our everlasting King. Alleluia. Amen.